How do you like this music? So this is from my uncle actually from the 80s, so perfect start to our course today. Today I'm going to start uh, talk a little bit about espresso. Uh, I might not be the be biggest expert on espresso anymore because I rarely work in a bar. Uh, however, I, I do roast a lot of coffee for espresso and I QC a lot of coffee for espresso. And this is where I do it. I actually I use this machine which is sort of one of a kind. FB70, one group, it's manual so you have to start and stop for, for yourself. Uh, basically it's an old linear inside but I put a PID uh, controller in so you have much more stable temperature. Um, and normally I either use the EK grinder to make espresso or I would use this Rober which is uh, with bigger burrs than normal. I took uh, some burrs from a three phase uh, Rober grinder and put in a single phase. Uh, grinder. So it's actually a rebuilt, you start and stop by yourself and so on. Uh, I'll probably change the grinder this year because there's some new exciting grinders on the market and uh, especially I'm waiting for the Malkonig Peak. For those of you who don't know just google Malkonig Peak and you'll see some photos. It's a better version of the K30 grinder that's on the market already. Uh, basically they fixed the lumping uh, or clumping uh, issues and I've actually been testing this grinder uh, for a while or uh, way back and uh, the extractions are really nice when you hit them but you have to extract a lot higher so you have to be around 21-22% to get espresso to taste really good and that's because of the narrow grind particle size. Alright, so let's define espresso. Uh, if you read any books um, about espresso it says that it's a you know a 30 mil uh, uh, shot uh, made in 25 seconds served in a small cup and so on. Uh, thankfully espresso has advanced a little bit since uh, the, that definition sort of was written and today I just personally I look at espresso as actually just a brewing method. It's a more concentrated brew of coffee. Uh, the only two ingredients are water and coffee uh, so I don't see it as uh, anything different than for instance a filter coffee. It's just more concentrated. We do roast a little different for our espresso and that's because when you have a lot more concentrated brew, especially the acidity, if you have a very acidic coffee it will be very intense and a lot of people tend to dislike that, me included. So we, our profiles are very similar to our filter profiles in terms of roasting but they're just developed slightly more so you sort of cut off that edge of the acidity a little bit. The reason why we don't use those coffees for our filter brews is because they tend to have a slight more bitterness than I, that I personally don't like that much. Alright, so we've established the definition of espresso, no we haven't, but it's uh, coffee and water brewed under pressure, uh, that's all I can say. And, and the, the pressure on my machine, uh, I've actually set it to around 9 bars, but you'll see on the needle uh, when I'm brewing that it'll probably say 10 bars. That's because I'm using a SCASE device to measure the, the pressure and temperature in the brew head and not somewhere else. So you lose a little bit of pressure during the brew cycle. How I find the perfect pressure, well there's no perfect pressure I would say, but normally what I would do is to, with this grinder that I have here, I would start maybe on 7 bars or even 6 bars and then slightly adjust upwards until I find the point where I can have the highest extraction with the same grind setting uh, because you want to be able to extract as much as possible from espresso. I find it actually quite hard to extract enough um, especially with these grinders um, uh, so it's better to adjust it so that you're able to extract as much as possible and then you can adjust the grind setting coarser if you don't want to have that high of an extraction. So what a temperature on this machine is about 93 and a half centigrade. If you are using Fahrenheit, stop doing that and then Google centigrade <laughs> or convert it because <laughs> then we can talk the same language. I, I don't remember what it is in Fahrenheit but um, yeah about 93 and a half to 94 degrees. Uh, it's okay to go lower, it's okay to go higher, whatever makes you happy and whatever makes it tasty. I think if you're brewing very long shots like on an EK, if you're brewing like 45-50 uh, gram shots the liquid tends to be very hot so you might want to think about that when you're brewing the coffee because there's a lot more liquid that's, uh, than for instance with a traditional 30ml uh, shot. So let's talk a little bit about the filter baskets because uh, obviously this is a single 
uh, shot filter basket. We don't really use those, we only use double uh, shot sing, uh, filter baskets. But the old filter baskets that comes with most machines are actually useless. They, the holes in them are very inaccurately made. Uh, some of them are very big, some of them are very small. So uh, if you grind too fine, for instance, you will just clog up the filter and nothing will come out. So in order to compensate for that, for that flow rate, we normally, in the old days, when we use these filters, we would overdose, so that means in an 18 gram filter, we would use probably 21 grams of coffee. And then you had to grind a lot coarser, which made you under extract the coffee. And also there was not enough water uh, in, in terms of how much coffee was in the filter. So we under extracted even more. So with the old filters, we rarely hit more than 17% extraction. And that means you're getting a, quite a sour shot and sometimes very salty because of the updosing. And to compensate for that sourness, we would roast our coffees much darker to cut the sort of acidity away during the roast. Uh, so when we switch to these uh, VST filter baskets, they come in different sizes. It doesn't really matter which one you use. We use 20 gram baskets here. So we use 20 gram of coffee in the filter. So that means less coffee than uh, we used to do before. Uh, and we have to grind finer to get the slow flow rate. Uh, that means to get uh, an espresso to extract for 30 seconds, you have to grind quite fine. And that makes you extract a lot more, which makes the espresso sweeter. On this grinder, we have to extract around 22%, I would say, between 21 and 22% to make the coffee taste sweet and not sour. But on this rubber that has a more uneven grind particle distribution, we rarely extract more than 19.5 to maximum 20% before the coffee start to taste too bitter. So the extraction percent really depends on your coffee, of course, and which grinder you use. So play a little bit around and, and get the refractometer. I'll show you how this works on espresso later, but you need to have that in order to be able to investigate what you're actually doing wrong when you're brewing espresso. Is it under extraction that's causing my coffee to taste sour or is it the roast or is it other things for instance. We talk about tampers and a lot of people ask me whether I should have a cone tamper or a flat tamper. I prefer to use flat tampers that makes the, the, the coffee bed perfectly even in the filter. What's probably more important is that the tamper actually fits the filter. So if it's a little bit small that you can move it around in the filter, that means you're not tamping around the sides and the water will very easily create some channels on the sides and you will have uneven extraction. So make sure if you have a VST filter, get a VST tamper or Pullman tamper. Uh, some people swear to the perk tamper. Personally, I haven't found any significant difference in those, but Make sure it just fits the filter. So 58.4 millimeter filter, same size tamper. All right, let's talk about uh, cups. We just introduced uh, a tasting in our store called Now and Then. Uh, these are the cups we were using back in the day. So uh, traditionally espressos are served in very narrow cups. The problem with these is that Especially when they're heated, the liquid ten or the espresso tends to taste very bitter. And also because you get a very concentrated crema, so it's, it's much thicker crema and the crema also tastes bitter. And then the, the flow of the liquid coming out, you have to, sort of, if you look at my head, I have to take my head quite far backwards to get the liquid out. And it hits only the middle of the tongue in the back. So you, this is the, if you really like bitter coffees, you should go with these uh, small cups and heat it as much as you can and roast your coffee as dark as you can and, and so on. So we don't use them here anymore, only for this tasting of course. We tend to use uh, wider cups, bigger cups, and the reason for that is to be able to smell the coffee so you can actually stick your nose and get some aromas out. The crema will be thinner so you don't have that sort of overwhelming bitterness on the first sip. It cools down the espresso, so these are room temperature before we use them. So it cools down the espresso, so you get a much better taste balance. And of course, obviously, we roast lighter now, and we have a lot more acidity in the espresso, so you need that temperature to go down in order to balance the taste. Uh, I'm not telling you what's right or wrong, just think about what cups you're using, the shape, the size, uh, how heavy they are, how, how quickly the temperature goes down when you, when you want to serve good espresso. 
We started uh, serving espresso in takeaway cups. We have never done that in the past eight years. The reason being that they actually don't steal a lot of heat from the liquid, so the espresso would stay burning hot for a long time and the, the taste balance was just totally off. But what we do now is actually we, we pull the espresso in a jug that's quite heavy, so it cools down the liquid, then we pour it in the uh, takeaway cup. Just because uh, it's good service. Uh, we always recommend people to drink from a porcelain cup, of course, but uh, sometimes, you know, even myself, we don't have a lot of time, so you need to bring your coffee somewhere. So I think good service is key. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the brew recipe we're going to use today. Uh, before, uh, we would use uh, 20 to 21 grams of coffee in the, the filter basket. And then we would get about 25 to 30 grams of liquid in the cup. And what that normally causes is under extraction because there's not enough water to, uh, to uh, extract the coffee with. So the water tends to get uh, full of uh, coffee juice very fast, but uh, there's a limit to how much you can fill in the water of coffee. So um, I normally recommend a 50% brew recipe which would be, now with the new filter baskets, uh, 20 grams of dry coffee in the filter and then around 40 grams of coffee in the cup. So you have to measure both with a scale actually. Uh, to do it by sight, you know, it's not very accurate. So uh, use a scale or if you have volumetrics on the machine, you can easily use those if you are measuring the dry dose. So let's just go through how it works. Of course, Rule number one, make sure your uh, portafilter is clean. I just cleaned this one so I know it's clean. Uh, very often I, when I do trainings and stuff, people just jump on the machine to, and they taste the coffee and they say, oh, it doesn't taste good, dirty machine. So make sure you have clean equipment before you start. Uh, on this machine, it's a little old, so there's some pipes going outside of the group head, so you need to flush for about five seconds. That means getting the water out from the group in order to heat the dispersion block and also the pipes inside. We do this just to get the stable brewing temperature. Now when I'm grinding, I'm, I'm trying to do it as fast as possible, of course, uh, because this is losing heat all the time and I want this to be hot. Um, otherwise you get inconsistent results. So try to be consistent when you work. It doesn't really matter exactly how you do it as long as you're consistent and think of the simple principles. So when we, we grind coffee, we want to have as much or as even a result as possible. So. Uh, all the filters should have equal amounts of coffee inside. Not like a pile on this side and nothing on the other side. Because the water will always go where it's the most easy way out. So when I grind I'm going to move this a little bit around just to fill the filter. That's normally how we do it. And then uh, some people like to, to shake, some people like to knock doesn't really matter. Um, as long as you know that there's equal amounts of coffee everywhere and you know the amount of coffee you have in the filter. So how do I know how much coffee I have in the filter now? I don't. So before you actually start doing anything, make sure your filter is empty and clean. Put the pour filter on a scale and tear it so it's a zero and then you can fill up your filter. I normally do this old school finger distribution, uh, whether it's a stock let's move or whatever, I don't really care as long as you're consistent. So 18.9 grams, that means I'm lacking one gram on this, so I'll put a little bit more on and then try to evenly distribute and then see, 20.2, I'm happy with that. Now a lot of baristas like to knock just to settle the ground a little bit. Uh, I would say that's okay. Just make sure you don't break your countertop or portafilters. The importance with tamping now, not necessarily hard, because it doesn't really matter if you tamp 3 kilos or with 20 kilos of force, because when the water hits this puck, it's going to start to expand, and the resistance is actually made by the filter holes, the pressure and uh, the this grind size of the coffee. So a lot of people say, well, it will start to uh, pour slower if I tamp really hard and so on. I don't really think so. Um, of course, it matters if you don't tamp 
or you tamp with 15 kilos, there's a little bit of difference because if you don't tamp, you get a lot of channeling that means water just forcing its way through the loose coffee grounds. So focus more on tamping straight and that means setting down the tamper straight and making sure it's level with the filter. You don't have to tamp more than once, but what I'm really careful with is that when you pull out the tamper that you don't do it too fast because you can create this sort of vacuum that sucks the puck up a little bit and you'll have a little uh, gap between the, the coffee and the filter and that's where all the water will go. I, I tend to like to polish uh, just so you don't have too many of these fines on the, on the tamper left, it just creates less uh, spill. Alright, so put a cup on your scale, turn the scale on. Obviously I work a little bit faster when I do this, but this is just for demo. Make sure it says zero. Put the porter filter in carefully. If you bang it in, then the whole puck will be disturbed and it'll have channeling. So very carefully. And then I start, start my stopwatch. And we can put the cup underneath. And a lot of people in the old days were watching the, the liquid and as soon as it turned on they will shut it off. But that creates under extraction normally. You need some of that sort of thin watery liquid to balance the salty, very concentrated liquid that comes in the beginning. So I'm going to stop there. So that's 40 and a half grams of liquid. If you want to check this on a refractometer, uh, you take one of the syringes and just draw some espresso in and out so you sort of mix the liquid evenly. Then you take a little bit in the syringe. You put one of these uh, syringe filters on, just screw it on like that. And then normally what I do is I actually take just one drop out in case there's some dust or something in the syringe filter. And then put three drops on the refractometer. Now the liquid needs to cool down a little bit. Uh, so that the temperature of the, the lens here and the liquid is the same before it reads the, the perfect TDS. Uh, not the perfect, but the correct. Um, so we'll see on this one. You see the numbers going up a little bit sometimes and that's because the liquid is getting colder. So you can dial in that number yourself um, if you have the Coffee Tools app from VST and then you can see the extraction. So I used about 20.2 grams of coffee from memory and the liquid in the cup was, that's not the, that's not the brew water weight, that's the beverage weight. That was 40.5 grams and then you dial in the TDS and then you see what your extraction percent is. One of the things I always check if, for instance, the TDS reads very low or the extraction is very low, I always take the port filter out to see if I had any severe channeling. Because if you have channeling and there's not any sort of visible channeling here, if you have channeling around the edges, for instance, uh, you will have a lower extraction. And that's because a lot of the water is just going around the coffee instead of through the coffee. So it's sort of finding an easy path. Uh, out of the filter basically. Um, so just when you test espresso I highly recommend just pulling a couple of shots of each coffee uh, to make sure that if you're using solubility as a measure tool for roasting for instance just eliminate the sort of errors of brewing mistakes because you can easily do a small mistake with the, uh, when brewing espresso because you know it's brewing with a lot of force and uh, yeah we all fail. Uh, ultimately, it's the taste that matters, of course, so... For me, this is a little sour. And basically, it was a little hot, so what I'll do is just pour some in another cup. I like to play with it a little bit, just to get the aromas. And there we have a much better taste balance, actually, just because of the temperature is down cup is a little wider and so on. Alright, so um, we didn't talk too much about extraction time and um, I don't really um,
focus too much on the time. Of course, from shot to shot, you need to be consistent. Um, before we were extracting espressos at you know around 20 seconds, and we thought that was awesome. But in my experience, that normally creates under extraction. Um, depends a little bit on the coffee. If I have a very soluble Kenyan coffee, for instance, you might have. Uh, an extraction time of 25 seconds but we're not afraid of going up even up to 40 seconds sometimes but normally we're in between 28 to 33 seconds on our extraction time it really depends on the grinder the coffee the pressure on the machine and so on and how much pre-infusion and so on um, I'm not afraid of what number it is as long as it tastes good so what we do now is we measure extraction and we extract until it tastes good and if that's 30 seconds, 25 seconds, or 33 seconds, it doesn't really matter. And just to be clear here, it really depends on the equipment you're using. If you're using a flatbird grinder, a conical grinder, and so on. And also, there's no ideal extraction percent. It really depends on your grinder, your coffee, your personal taste, the roast profile, or the pressure of the machine, and so on. So there's a lot of uh, variables here that you can really play with. Um, and I haven't even mentioned the water quality, which is a whole different thing. Um, our water here in Norway is kind of soft, so it tends to accentuate uh, acidity and a little astringency in the coffee. So uh, sometimes it's a little hard to get that sort of full-bodied sweet shot that uh, a lot of people are looking for. All right, um, let's make another one. And uh, just to show if there are any sort of new beginners here, just to show how it probably shouldn't look like. And uh, I'll give you some pointers. So now we're using about, let's see, 20.3 grams. I'm gonna take some off because that's okay. 20.1 and I'm just going to put my finger in like that just to make it uneven and then also tamp a little loosely and not that little. So now there should be less coffee on the right side of the, the filter. Always wipe the filter, it just makes your machine a little bit cleaner. And we'll put the cup on the scale. Remember now the filter holder is a little cold. I had a finger on the right hand side here. And we're going to see how this brews. So normally what you can see now, uh, when you have severe channeling, now this is extreme, the liquid coming out of the spouts are very, very thin and bright in color. That's a very good indicator that you're doing something terribly wrong. Also, the extraction time is a lot faster than it was on the previous shot. And the numbers are almost the same as before. And I'll just show you on the refractometer how much of a difference it makes um, so that you start paying attention to what you're actually doing when you're making the espresso. So one drop out and then three drops on the refractometer with a couple of seconds. This is the Zen moment. You see already, it's, it's a lot lower. It's almost half of what we had uh, on the previous shot, just because of channeling. So it's around five, I'm guessing. And it tastes awfully sour and very, very thin and watery. There's no sweetness, no body. And let's have a little look at the filter. Uh, finally, you can't really see where I had my finger. There's a couple of holes here on the right side, small, tiny little holes, and there's a lot of channeling on the side here. So, in my opinion, channeling is probably the biggest cause of sour espressos around. If if all the parameters are, uh, you know, the roast is good, you're using the right filter, the right tamper, and so on. But if you're, for instance, pulling your tamper up too fast, you get this sort of suction that sucks the puck up, and you have a little gap around and you'll, you'll immediately have some channeling. It won't be as extreme as this, so you might probably lose uh, you know, even 1% in extraction. And that's the difference between a really sweet and full-bodied shot to a quite sour shot that is not very balanced. So 
If you're unsure uh, when you're making espresso for customers, if you're unsure whether this espresso is good and, uh, or not, just don't serve it. Because if you're not sure, it means it's probably not good enough. And the best coffee shops don't serve the bad stuff. We all make them, but we, uh, we tend not to try to serve them. It's impossible to quality control every single shot, of course. What's the ideal extraction rate? Again, the ideal extraction, uh, it really depends on the grinder. On this, if I'm using the EK grinder that has a very even distribution of uh, the particle size of uh, the coffee grounds, that means you're not over extracting the fines and you're not under extracting the big particles. So all the particles are more or less the same size. Uh, and that means I can extract more without having the bitterness from the over extracted fines and the sourness from the under extracted boulders. Uh, so on this grinder, I tend to enjoy espressos that are between 21 and 22 percent. Sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. On the rover, which has a lot more variety of ground particle size, so it has the small fines and the bigger particles, uh, the fines tend to create a little bit more bitterness and also the bigger ones a little bit more sourness. So that bitterness really tends to be a little dominant when I'm above 20 percent. On some coffees we have been above 20%, but normally we're between 18.5 to 19.5. So it's, it's, uh, it really depends on your, on your grinders and also your roast, of course. If you're roasting a little dark, you'll have the bitterness anyway, so you might compensate by under-extracting a little bit so you get more acidity. But acidity can be either pleasant when you have sugar present, that means a good extraction with a high acidity coffee will taste balanced and and give you joy and pleasure, um, whereas uh, a sour coffee, an under-extracted coffee, uh, will give you an acidity that is really sharp and unbalanced. So it, I normally compare it to when you make lemonade. If you make lemonade with just water and lemon juice, it's normally quite unpleasant to drink. Put some honey or sugar or something sweet in there and it's pleasant to drink and that's what a higher extraction will do, up to a certain point. Because you hit that sort of edge where it just becomes very bitter and uh, that's also not very pleasant. So you need to find that balance. And the only way to find out is if you measure and taste. Only measuring doesn't really get you anywhere because the numbers is just a number. You need to start tasting and, and relate the extraction percent to taste according to your roast and your grinder and so on. So do you clean the filter basket right away? Normally in our store uh, we have you know, periods so when we're very busy we don't clean them straight away. We, we leave the puck in until the next door and we, you know, especially on Saturdays and Sundays we make espresso constantly. On a weekday we'll, we'll make one, uh, the puck will probably be inside for 5 to 10 minutes and if it's been there for too long we'll knock it out and rinse the filters. Uh, before when we were using less water to make espresso, uh, it would be a bigger difference whether the temperature of the porter filter was high or low. Uh, meaning, uh, you would immediately see it on the flow of the espresso if the, if the porter filter was a little cold, for instance. Now, when we're using finer grinds and more water, um, the water is more than hot enough to compensate for that couple of degrees whether you have the puck in or not. So, I don't really pay too much attention about it. What really bothers me, especially now when our roasts are lighter and our coffees taste cleaner, uh, if you can taste dirty porter filter taste, that's a really unpleasant flavor. So we, we tend to do a rinse of the complete uh, rinse where we wipe and scrub and everything every hour on our porter filters and filter baskets. And then we also do a little back flush every hour on our, mach our machines. Whereas, uh, you know, if we're just uh, having a small break, we'll just rinse it under the group head. Uh, just basically use the water, knock the puck out, and just rinse everything. And that's it. All right, I think we covered most of it. Um, one of the, one other thing we can talk a little bit about is. Um, a uh, couple of things that can make your extraction go down again, and especially if you're using these rubber grinders, uh, you tend to have what David Schomer calls the popcorn effect, uh, which is uh, you'll have some big particles just falling through the, the burrs because they're jumping around and they're finding their way out. So if 
if your level of coffee is going down in the hopper. So that means when you're, you're sort of towards the end of uh, your coffee here, uh, the grinder will act like it, if it's adjusted coarser and coarser. And that, of course, creates under extraction. So if it's at the end of the day, just compensate by grinding a little bit finer. If it's in the middle of the day, make sure your uh, bean hoppers are full. Uh, that really makes a big difference. So uh, if you have even pressure in the bean hopper, it really makes a difference. Obviously on an EK grinder like this one, you'll, you'll pre-measure your doses, uh, 20 grams or 21 grams or whatever you prefer to use, and you'll grind every dose uh, separately. So that's a little different dynamic. We don't use the EK in our store to make espressos because the workflow is a nightmare. And uh, we will change our grinders when we find the right one. Uh, so far, I haven't really found it yet. So where would, would you start with like uh... A beginner to the espresso world, which grinder and uh, Ooh, machine? As a beginner, and and this is uh, this is uh, something that a lot of people ask me. But I would say, if you're interested in only espresso, uh, spend your money on the grinder and not the machine. So you know the Ranchilio Silvia or something very simple. Most of the machines are basically uh, machines that deliver hot water and pressure and that's it you know um, so a simple machine but spend your money on a really good grinder so uh, I would actually say that you have a lot more uh, gap of quality if you buy like a small home grinder that grinds very unevenly than if you have a really professional grinder like a, a Musser Colney for instance or or a EK or whatever so uh, ask your local barista because it really depends on which country you're in, what grinders are available to what price. But uh, I would say buy a professional grinder and buy a home machine. That's when you get the best results at home. Um, but why would you make espresso at home? I mean, it's so much work. I used to have this machine at home and I ended up never using it because uh, it takes a lot of cleaning. You have to stand there, you know, and test a lot of shots, adjust the grind, and you use, you know, half of a bag of coffee just to adjust the grinder. So I highly recommend people to do manual brewing at home and then enjoy espresso in, in coffee shops. Unless you're really, really, really fanatically interested in espresso. Then of course, get a machine, get a grinder and get all the equipment and gadgets and get some good scales. I highly recommend the new Akaya scale. So the guys who made these scales that you can uh, hook up with your iPad or iPhone, they're really accurate and quite lightweight, you can actually, um, you can actually um, ch recharge the batteries, which is fantastic, so you don't have too much waste on batteries. The new small one that's coming out very soon is for espresso and uh, is waterproof, so, um, you know, I've, I've spent so many of these scales just because I forgot to remove it when I was flushing the water and so on, and it will be just soaked in water and obviously it breaks, so. Uh, a good scale is always handy to have, and you can also use it baking or whatever, or manual brewing. Um, but uh, I would say, yeah, spend your money on the grinder, get a decent machine that has the ability to have a 58 millimeter uh, filter inside. So the Ranchilio, for instance, has that ability, because you want to throw the standard filter away and spend a little bit of money on a VST filter. Um, I'm not getting any money to say this, but this filter makes a huge difference in extraction. We, when we changed to this, we were able to go from maximum 17% extraction to you know a possible 22 if you wanted to. Not that you want that always, but uh, at least this gives you the possibility to extract more and gives you sweeter espresso. And then obviously, uh, spend your money on good ingredients. So you cannot make a uh, good espresso with a really terrible coffee. That's impossible. So you have to have a good coffee uh, with a good roast that's reasonably fresh, not too fresh. Prefer to let my coffees rest for maybe up to a week before I use it on my espresso machine. That also goes for a manual, man, manual brewing at minimum four days and up to a week. Just to get rid of that sort of slightly freshly baked bread flavor that you have in freshly roasted coffee. Buy coffee in sealed bag, that's important. And um, 
make sure they're not too oily or something you know then all the potential in the coffee is roasted away and you're just gonna get very bitter coffees should you buy a blend or not uh, we don't blend any coffee anymore obviously when we buy coffee from a farm it's a blend of many cherries put together but we try to separate on variety on the harvest day we try to separate as much as possible if the coffee has great quality it will for sure give you a great espresso. If you are buying coffees that are not so good quality, of course the espresso won't taste good because it's water and coffee and if one of your ingredients is poor quality, it will obviously not taste very good. So I tend to find actually because espresso is so extreme and it gives you such a concentrated brew, I tend to find that you actually need to have your highest quality coffees brewing for espresso brewing and with filter coffee because you have a lower strength that means lower concentration of flavors and lower concentrated coffee you can actually get away with you know slightly lower quality but not that we try to do that we try to buy as good as coffees as we can but on any farm there will be some coffees that are fantastic and some that are not so fantastic so you have to really think about this when you buy coffees personally I love making espresso on Ethiopian coffees single origin Ethiopian coffees Kenyan coffees you know whatever makes me happy I mean and I want to taste, be able to taste the acidity, the fruits, the floral notes in the coffee and not too much of the roast, roasted notes. So that's why a lot of people think our coffees are, you know, they're, they're thin and so on. But the strength is actually there. It's just, it's a lighter roast so you have less bitterness. Um, yeah, so we, we're, we're over that stage where the espresso, you know, should be a punch in the stomach. We actually want to taste what, where the coffee is from and... Uh, and how it was processed and so on. That's what we're interested in now. And yeah, that gives you a lot more acidity, but if you extract well, the sweetness will balance the acidity. So as a way the, the now and then uh, tasting, how did you recreate the old one? Oh, so for those of you who know what the now and then tasting is, we should probably do a periscope on that in two weeks. Um, um, now and then was uh, a tasting where we we made a blend, so it was 40% Brazil, 60% Kenyan coffee mixed together before we roasted. Then we roasted it uh, according to our old recipes uh, that we had in 2010 because I had them in my computer. Uh, so it was like a 15 minute roast. The results were obviously very baked and much darker than what we do now. Now we're typically roasting an espresso around 11 minutes and much lighter uh, and no blends. So the, it was a blend, it's not a single origin, uh, based on what we did in 2010. Uh, it was a roast based on what we did in 2010. We used the old standard La Marsocco filter basket, um, where we put 21 grams of dry dose in the filter, and about 25 to 26 grams of liquid in the cup, which we served in a small, really hot cup like this. Um, cup. That's Norwegian cup. Um, so we basically tried to just replicate what we were doing back then, and the results are astonishing. Like, if you really want your coffee to taste as bitter and, and strong as possible, now that's the 2010 version. But if you want to taste, uh, you know, what kind of cultivar or variety that was used, where the coffee is from, then our newer version would be, which is what I've been showing you today, is uh, the way to go. So when you taste them side by side, you know. The reason why I made this tasting was we have some customers and also some journalists that say, you know, espresso was much better before and it should be strong and blah, blah, blah. Um, when you taste it side by side, you can see how much we've developed uh, in the, over the years. So typically the, the old version, the 2010 espresso extraction would be 16 to 17%. Very strong because it's a very concentrated shot, only 25 grams in the cup. And the new version will be a lighter roast extracted to almost 20%. So it's a huge difference in, in flavor profile. All right, I think we are uh, through today. Uh, we're we're going to try to make this a little shorter. That's why I heard the alarm go off a couple of minutes ago. Uh, I'm not sure when or what the next Periscope will be with, but we're getting some visitors here in, uh, in, quite a, uh, in one or two weeks from Honduras some of the farmers we buy from, so it might be a little interview with that. But if you have any suggestions on what we need to talk about on Periscope, please tweet us or send us a message on, online and then we'll, we'll see if there's other topics that we haven't thought about ourselves that we want to talk about.
So, that's about it. Thanks for watching.